Good evening, and Edward Nussing, welcome. Uh, tonight we have BCS and .NET Southwest here tonight. Please do ask questions, both during and ask after the presentation. Probably during is a good time to ask them, because technical questions are best answered as I present them, or as I present the material. Um, and afterwards, we'll have some questions, and then if you want to head to the pub, I'm more than happy to. So FlingRest, an introduction. FlingRest is my project that I started before I came to university. Um, what is FlingOS? FlingOS is an educational operating system. Okay, the whole purpose of the project is education. It's not about implementing uh, a commercial operating system in C Sharp that would rival Linux or Windows or anything like that. Our project is not just the code base. It's backed up by over 30 articles and 10 tutorial videos. The tutorial videos are a getting started series that actually introduce you to operating system and low-level development and take you from just understanding programming as a general thing to understanding some assembly code and understanding uh, the basics of an operating system and giving you some sample code that you could then extend, basically. The whole project is free and open source online. If you haven't had the chance to look, please go to our website. Uh, the code is on GitHub. The videos are on YouTube under Creative Commons. Uh, and the code itself is released under GitHub, uh, not GitHub, sorry, GNU. Uh, general Public license, license Version 2, <coughs> along with all the articles. So the OS is written in C-sharp. That's the big thing this evening, and we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but to explain why we use C-sharp, I have to explain a little bit of what the purpose of Fling OS is. So I've said it's about education, and our primary aims are to provide resources for teaching and learning operating systems development, but also low-level development comes into that as well. And it's to provide a way for high-level developers to transition to low-level development. Okay? It's not about saying you're coming in cold. It's about saying you already understand high-level development. How do we take that knowledge and actually get you to use that as a platform for learning low-level development and operating systems? And there's some secondary aims. I also prevent, uh, prevent, present talks uh, to raise awareness of the educational problems surrounding low-level development and operating system development which is increasingly problematic with uh, the growth of IoT, Internet of Things. And to also try and encourage academics and industry to think in a new way about teaching this stuff. There's been a very um, strong mindset of just teaching C and then teaching operating systems from that and assuming nothing and not working with what students already know. That's actually problematic given the new national curriculum uh, for schools from Key Stage 1, so that's primary school, all the way up to Key Stage 4 and A-level, has no low-level teaching. No C, no C++, nothing. It just has Python and high-level development. Despite things like the BBC Microbit, by the way. BBC Microbit is programmed in something roughly equivalent to Scratch and Python. So that brings me on to why we're necessary. We're necessary as a project because online resources are currently really weak. If you go to osdev.org or osdev.net, they're the two best sites for learning this stuff from and for technical information about how to program different aspects. All of their articles, they've got a lot of them, but a lot of them are poorly written. A lot of them aren't written by native English speakers, which makes them quite hard to read. And quite often the sample code, which is in C usually, uh, is not easy to read and not well tested. Other resources that you for teaching that have been named to me are things like Linux and Linux. Linux, if you've ever looked at the code, is just a nightmare to navigate through. And from an educational point, you can't strip it back far enough to just show the different components. And Linux 3 is a commercial operating system. All of their resources now focus mainly on the operating system itself rather than teaching operating systems and low level as a whole. And the book for it is like $200. So students aren't going to be able to afford that. We think a £50 textbook is expensive uh, at university nowadays. And also, the majority of existing developers are high level. If you actually look at the industry and how it's split up, it's a hugely weighted towards high level and web developers. And all, as I said, the new national curriculum means all new students are going to be high level developers, bar the few who take an interest outside of school. Um, so that means we're actually tackling the problem ahead of time. And yeah, the majority of teaching at university is, is in the high level after the first year, roughly. Uh, at this university, and uh, at this university, we do better. We actually teach operating systems in the second year as well, but many don't. Um, 
So why C-sharp? That's the interesting question. Uh, it's a familiar high-level language for students, basically. The transition from Java to C-sharp for students is really easy. Uh, the two languages are sufficiently similar that actually it's not very hard to transition between them. Uh, and it's also mo modestly easy to transition from something like Python to C-sharp. It's, you know, it's a familiar set of high-level ideas uh, that students are familiar with. It's much easier than transitioning to C. Oops, sorry. Because C-sharp is accessible in a way that C isn't. Um, C is hard for students, particularly ones from a high-level background. The idea that you no longer have classes and the memory management and all of that structure that gets taken away when you move to C, that's actually harder to remove from a person's knowledge than it would be if they'd gone in not knowing any programming. Um, so yeah. And it's harder than a lot of people in the industry who program in C all the time realize. Um, C Sharp is also portable. Fling OS can be compiled using Mono. It's a bit of fun. I found that out the other day when a Reddit user told me, by the way. I've never actually tested it. Um, and C Sharp is also really powerful. Um, I, I argue it's probably more powerful than C, but we'll come on to that. So expectations for students coming to this. We're expecting people to come to it familiar with, oops, sorry, familiar with programming and or if they're not already programmers, they're studying a formal course that will teach them it alongside. And one of the key things about Fling OS being in a high level language means that you can teach high level languages faster than you can teach C generally um, for students. And it also means that as a result, you can teach high level language and then teach Fling OS and operating systems alongside C. You can learn the two simultaneously rather than current approach where you'd have to learn C followed by operating systems. Okay, so we hope the students will find our resources useful and take advantage of all three types of learning. The learning by example from the code, learning by uh, reading our articles, and learning by the audio visual through the videos. So, technical background. I'm going to go through a few things just before we delve into Fling OS, um, simply to give you some background and some context. So, C Sharp. C Sharp's IL code is very well defined, it's very well documented on, MS on MSCN. And it's highly stable. That's one. These are three really good reasons for picking C Sharp for doing what we do. Uh, Java bytecode is equally well defined, documented, and stable, but a little bit trickier to access um, across platforms. Um, C Sharp I consider easy to read. Java is a bit harder to read, in our opinion. Um, if you've come across Java, it tends to be quite bloated, uh, and the documentation doesn't work as well either. Uh, they have things like Doxygen, C Sharp has built-in documentation support that's even supported by MS Build and it's got fantastic intelligence and things like that. So everything we do is inside Visual Studio uh, and we highly recommend Visual Studio. So yeah, C Sharp is generally re renowned for having a low bloat, relatively low bloat syntax compared to Java. And lastly, C Sharp is very easy to hook into. There's no need for an entire custom compiler. And I'm going to show you this evening how we compile C Sharp code into machine code without having an entire compiler written from scratch. Unlike Java, we looked into Java and you would actually have to write it from syntax all the way down to code generation. Another question, is C Sharp as powerful as C? Yes, because you can switch on pointers. And if you're not familiar with how to switch on pointers in C Sharp, Word of warning, don't do it. .NET Framework will complain a lot. Um, but if you're not using the .NET Framework, you can enable them. And MS Build does support pointers. So I'm going to show you this evening how you can actually turn C Sharp into something that looks similar to C, but with a lot of the structure left in place. Um, C Sharp, as a result of having pointers, it means you're manu you don't have to manage memory manually, but you can if you want to. Okay, so that means it is possible to write an operating system in it. One of the key features of an operating system is memory management. Whereas in C, you have to manually manage the memory. There's no idea of uh, automatically creating an object and having it garbage collected later. C Sharp has much better structure than C. Uh, native compilation is not standard in C Sharp. That's a disadvantage. C, everything is native compiled, uh, roughly. Unless you're using L L V M or something, something similar. C Sharp is low performance. This is the key reason why we say we're not trying to produce an operating system to rival commercial ones. Okay, so you wouldn't write C Sharp code for an operating system because it's slow, fundamentally. Uh, whereas C is much, much higher performance. C Sharp also takes up a lot of space. Sorry, did you? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, C sharp takes up a lot of space both in memory and on disk. So also for embedded devices, and I will say later a bit about how we support embedded devices is not appropriate technically for that, but it is good for education. C sharp's well defined. C isn't really well defined, if I'm honest. Um, I, I come across lots of C code that redefines the standard types. Uh, you can use many different variations, variations of standard libraries, and you can redefine sizes of types in the compiler uh, using different options. C sharp, you can't do any of that. It's one size, one thing, every platform, all the same. So actually, when you're reading C sharp code, you know what you're reading. You know what you get, and it's portable. C sharp portable by paradigm because you're compiling it to IL code, which is platform independent, pretty much. Um, so, brief bit on compiler structure. Is that readable? Can you read that? Just about. Um, what you get is the language source code in, Alexa and syntax and intermediate code generation, or intermediate representation. That's going to be the bit that MS Build does. There's an optimizer in there. We actually don't use optimizations, and I'll speak about why in a minute. Um, and then there's the target code generator, which is what produces your machine code. Okay, and a little bit on OS structure is very, I'm not going to go a huge amount into full operating system structure, but roughly when we say operating system, we don't mean applications, we mean the bit that's referred to as the kernel, uh, which runs drivers and uh, interaction between firmware and abstraction, basically. Hardware abstraction layer, how if you've, if you've come across it, it's one of the aspects of it. Okay, so technical detail. Let's look in a little bit more. So our compiler, I like this quote, I've yet to meet a C compiler that is more friendly and easier to use than eating soup with a knife. <laughs> uh, our compiler is nothing like that complex, fortunately. Um, we use msbuild, or xbuild, as we found out the other day, which is Mono's version, to compile C sharp into an intermediate language. Notably, that means you could also do this in VB.NET or F sharp or some variants of C++, the Microsoft offer. So it's not just restricted to C-sharp, but we, we prefer to use C-sharp. Our compiler, which internally we refer to as the driver's compiler, and I'll explain why in a minute, um, takes the IL code in the .dll files um, that's produced by msbuild and converts that into assembly code. Oh, we, we can target x86 or MIPS assembly. Um, we then use NASM or GTC whichever tool it is that's built into GCC, I can't remember what's the top of my head, um, to convert assembly code into machine code. Okay, that's the native code. Th this step is really the native compilation, and then this is just a, a conversion from text format to binary format, if you like. And then we use LD, which is part of the GNU project, to link the whole thing together. We can actually link things either to an ISO for use in a virtual machine, or we can link them to .a and .elf files, libraries, executables. So you can actually build and compile drivers or in fact applications using our compiler as well. It's a one size fits all compiler. Um, we originally had something called the kernel compiler that did only ISO files. We implemented a new uh, compiler which we call the drivers compiler, which also supports MIPS as well. We could extend that to a support ARM and things like that. So, some compiled C-sharp code. Here's our basic demo method that I wrote earlier. Uh, does not very much very interesting, but it, you'll get the idea. Using ILSpy, you can actually view the IL code for any compiled C-sharp code. In fact, any compiled .NET framework library. And this is quite helpful for actually seeing what, what, what these lines of code got translated into. So, you can see the declaration of locals up here. And then this one here, which has a very odd name, um, is an auto-generated intermediate local variable. So in debug build, you may not realize, but your code actually gets loads of knocks inserted into it. And these are used as debug points by the, by the debugger later on. Um, this, for example, is a load constant. So it's just pushing a value to a stack. Storing a local, so it's taking the values on the stack and putting it into somewhere else on the stack, technically, but in, in, in the stack frame for the current function. 
uh, loading another constant and storing it. So this is load, we did load one, installed it in X, we did load two, installed it in Y. Uh, then we load the two values of the local variables, zero, so local zero and local one, X and Y, add them together, a bit there, store them back in Z. Then we load that value and store it in local three, which is that intermediate, which is used for the return value. And then lastly, it branches to the end of the method. It's a zero distance branch. So in the IO, the IL code in debug mode is really inefficient. This can be highly, the, the NSBuild compiler could optimize all of this IL code. We don't use IL optimizations because it allows us to directly translate from C-sharp to IL code. And it will also allow us to translate directly to assembly code. So you can translate directly from this, from this assembly code to where the C-sharp was. If we turned on optimizations, that would no longer be possible. Okay, so for students and for everyone reading this code, it's fantastic. Our compiler outputs this as the function, basically. And you'll see our, our assembly code is not necessarily the most efficient, but it is at least reasonably clear. Um, so we start with the function label declaration. We push, uh, we, well, we do the um, calling convention stuff. We push local space for locals. As I said, this is a debug knot, and we'll look at the debug later this evening. Uh, and then you can see how we just push a value, pop a value, push a value, pop a value, push, push, pop, pop, and out. And you can see how that translates to this IL code over here in the C-sharp. So it's really straightforward and it's really nice to do. And for each line of assembly code, you actually have the IL offset that generated it. So you'll see here, all of these lines of IL have a number next to them. This isn't an index. I know that pretty much incremental here. Um, it's actually the number of bytes from the start of that method declaration in the bytecode, okay? Um, so this allows you to translate from the assembly code to which IL it was. It's also used by the debugger later to translate. So when we're compiling, you've probably got, or you may, it may have gone through your mind that actually there's some issues with this because at the low level, you have to be able to write some assembly code you can't do everything in C-sharp. There are some assembly operations you have to do uh, that can't be built into a compiler. And even for C, this isn't possible. For C, they use something called inline assembly. For what we do, we have to have an equivalent. So we use C-sharp attributes. Are you all familiar with C-sharp attributes? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, we use C-sharp attri attributes to flag things to our compiler instructions to our compiler, basically. And we do something called ASM plugging, which is roughly equivalent to inline assembly. What it does is we flag a method as being plugged. We give it a file path, which is relative to the build folder or the project folder. You can determine which. I'll explain why there's no extension on this file path in a moment. We give it a file, and it takes all the IL or all the ASM that would have been generated for that method, deletes it from the output, and inserts the contents of the file. Okay, so it's a direct substitution from an assembly, hand-coded assembly file into where that method was. Assuming you hand-coded the assembly correctly, i.e. following the calling convention and using the right method label name, um, then you can call this method from other C-sharp code without a problem. This, also, this method also allows us to sequence particular blocks of ASM so you can put them right at the start or right at the end of the operating system. That lets you do various bits of initialization code that aren't actually ever called. Things like processor initialization when the bootloader first starts the operating system. And then there's one other aspect to filling some gaps, which is replacing the .NET framework. We do not use the .NET framework but, unfortunately, you can't ditch things like the object class and string and array. Those are the three that, even if you try to avoid them, um, the Microsoft compiler will still try and put them in. By default, all classes inherit from object. Okay? So, we have a way around this, which is we create our own object class, we mark it as the object class using an attribute, and then every class in our system has to, at some point, via some root, inherit from that object class. 
any and all calls to the .NET framework get ignored and the compiler outputs an error message saying, what are you thinking? Um, so if you try and make calls to the .NET framework, it will simply fail. It will simply give up. Um, so yeah, we, we, we patch around it. We also have our own string class and our own array class. Um, so far as possible though, we make those match the same kind of functionality that you would get in the .NET framework. So our object class has a type field. So you can access the type of any object and the whole, you can actually do complete reflection at runtime within the operating system. We have support for all of that. So, C Sharp from an operating system. Am I insane? Uh, possibly, but not because I'm using C Sharp. As I said, it's good for education. So getting started. There's a few prerequisites when an operating system starts from the bootloader. We have to do some processor initialization, things like setting up the interrupt descriptors table. Interrupts are when, a say, a device or an exception tries to notify something to the processor. It pauses whatever's currently executing and runs a separate method. So we have to do things like that. And we have to, uh, sorry, and to do that we use the sequenced ASM files to put the initialization code right at the top of the ISO file, right at the top of the machine code. And we also have to do things like calling static constructors. Because when you start a .NET application, the .NET framework, or the .NET runtime, sorry, calls static constructors for you and for calls any, initializes any static fields in memory for you, yeah? Which you're, most of the time you're never aware of. Um, but because we're running it from nothing, we have to do that manually. So the compiler will automatically fill an empty method with calls to all the static constructors in the right order. Um, however, you, you're not required to call that initialization method, so you could just leave it out if you wanted to and see what happens. And this brings me on to one of the powerful things about what we do with FlingOS. We, nothing's mandatory. You can switch on and off any part of the operating system and see what happens. A lot of the time it will break it because in, operating systems are so interconnected. Um, but, you know, you could, it's modularized. You can actually see what's going on, replace things with your own implementation. And then the main method. Again, mark with an attribute. Um, so at compile time, you can specify the entry point. Flinger, uh, not Flinger, C Sharp does have support for hash defines. Compilation symbols in Visual Studio are possible. Uh, things like hash if debug, so include code conditionally if it's in debug mode. Um, most of the time in C-sharp programming it's not very useful and you'd find better software engineering ways of doing it, but at a low level it can become quite helpful. We can have different build modes for different tests and have different entry points for those different tests. It also allows us to build drivers directly into the operating system in a more monolithic kernel way without the main functions conflicting by name basically. The compiler won't get confused. So, um, I'm going to try and show you briefly a sample operating system. I'm going to do it through GitHub because I haven't cloned this uh, locally. So we have our tutorial video series, which comes with complete sample code. And by the time you get to number six, you've done all the processor initialization. And you can see we've got a C-sharp sample. So the sample kernel, that's all the files you need for a basic operating system. Okay, It doesn't do anything. It just starts up and prints some colors of the screen. But it will function. Uh, the assembly code. There's a single assembly plug file, which has some, some in the, pro, the process of initialization stuff, and then kernel.cs. So you can see here, is that large enough? Good. Um, you can see here, this is the plug sequence to start at the very start of the operating system that does the process of initialization. And this is the main method that just prints some color and then pauses. And it can actually return to the bootloader, a bit weirdly. Um, most operating systems would never return to the bootloader, by the way. Um, and then this is the empty method for calling static constructors that's filled in. This call static constructors method is called from this boot assembly code. 
before the main method is called. Okay. So you can see here how we have pointers enabled. A U short pointer. Sorry, I'm drifting. Uh, and we just initialize it to a fixed address. This, that fixed address is the start of the VGA um, text mode frame buffer. Okay, you can print characters straight to the screen using that address. Um, and if you're wondering how to enable pointers in C sharp, it's really actually quite simple. So Visual Studio, I've got a project here. I'm clicking properties. And then you just enable unsafe code. Job done. You've got access to pointers. And in fact, a .NET Framework application running on top of Windows can use native pointers. Um, you have to use things like int pointer um, to do it, but it is possible. Um, if you're playing around with interacting with C++ libraries, you start have, having to do it. Um, things like that. Call, calling down to the operating system manually. Um, .NET Framework handles most of that for you most of the time. Sometimes it's useful. So what about managed memory? We're writing an operating system, so you don't get anything by default. You have to do it manually. Um, so how do we deal with the fact that C Sharp supports managed memory? Well, we have a custom heap implementation. Uh, memory for that heap is initialized, uh, allocated by the comp well by by the stub assembly code that we have, uh, and then just split up according to our implementation. We actually use a fairly simple binary heap. And again, that's, we use simple implementations because then you can understand the intention of the code rather than spending ages working out what some fancy algorithm was doing. Uh, we let students do an algorithm. We, we assume students are going to do an algorithms course or something like that at some point, and they can then realize that our implementations are inefficient and improve them for themselves. And we have a custom garbage collector. Calls to the garbage collector are inserted by the compiler in all the usual places. And the IL code actually tells you when you're supposed to do things like that. Um, so according to the IL spec, when you load an, an object, you have to, or, sorry, load an object into a local, you've got to increment its ref count. Great, so we put in the calls. And again, we're using attributes to say what functions in our custom garbage collector are um, to be called for the different situation, situations. Um, so, an example of that. In the Fling Ice code base, in our libraries, we have a replacement for the system library, roughly. It roughly matches what's in the system library. And you can see here, two classes. Sorry, I'm just going to close down these other files I have open. Um, so we've got two classes, the heap, simple binary heap, not used by the compiler directly. Um, this is actually roughly thread safe, hence why you've got enter and exit critical stuff. Um, various statistic methods, stuff like that. So you can see the various aspects we have here and we can do lots of different allocations and there's one simple free function. The garbage collector is a little more interesting. Oh, by the way, we use hash define uh, trace and hash undef, and then you can comment out the undef, and it will switch on a ton of trace information that will print out uh, either to the screen or to a serial port everything the operating system is doing for that class. It produces an awful lot of information and slows the thing down, but you can have, it allows students to actually see everything that's going on every time a garbage collector uh, function call is, occurs. So the garbage collector state exists per, pro per process. Um, keeps track of the, the total number of objects and strings. And our garbage collector in this implementation has a very simple cleanup list. It doesn't have a tree, it won't detect um, reference loops, for example, uh, detached objects, things like that. Um, so in that sense, our garbage collector could be improved. Um, but as I said, we're using simple Im implementations for now. So, yeah, the functions that the, uh, the compiler actually makes calls to are these. New object, new array, new string, 
as I go down. Increment ref count, decrement ref count of an object. Um, and yeah, those are the only ones it makes a, makes calls do. When the ref count of an object hits zero, it gets added to the cleanup list. In the .NET framework, or .NET runtime, the garbage collector is man manually, not manually, is automatically managed for you. So the .NET runtime works out a prime opportunity to call the garbage collector cleanup method and to compact memory and rearrange stuff. Okay? Because we're allowing native pointers, uh, we don't do memory rearrangement at the moment. Okay? Uh, the references that the garbage collector gives out are actually pointers, so you can convert directly to and from them. Um, which means our garbage collector can never actually function in quite the same way the .NET Frameworks one does. At low level though, that doesn't really matter, um, because a conventional memory allocator in an operating system wouldn't be able to do memory re rearrangement anyway, so it's not something we think students need to know about. Um, so the cleanup method for our garbage collector has to be called manually because there is no framework, there is no runtime around this. Uh, originally, this was a single tasking operating system, which meant that you had to manually insert calls to the cleanup method all over the code at points when you knew memory was about to run out. Now it is a multitasking operating system and each process has a separate cleanup thread um, that runs in the background. At the moment, those threads run roughly on every three seconds, they call the garbage collector to clean up. Um, the only time we found that it runs out of memory is when it's actually run out of heat memory. Um, and we're, we're, we've just got to undergone various code transformation that I'll talk about later, but automatic heap growth is not implemented yet, but it will be in the very near future. Okay. So, that's a little bit of the C-sharp code and a little bit of understanding as to how we get around some of the issues. What about exceptions? Yes, we have exception support. Um, again, exception methods are marked by attributes for handling and throwing. Uh, it's only actually four functions, really. There's, there's very little code required for actually handling and dealing with exceptions um, and handling all the control flow changes. Um, and yeah, the handlers themselves are implemented in C-sharp. There's only three stub pieces of assembly code. One is for accessing the stack pointer. The other is for accessing the base pointer or the frame pointer. So those are very small methods. And the third one is simply for arbitrarily jumping to any address you like. Um, because you need to be able to jump from wherever the exception occurred to wherever the handler is. You can't actually do that as a function call per se. So, Example of throwing exception, if I can. Um, we have a class called exception methods. If I scroll down here, the compiler can insert calls to these various methods for automatically throwing things like null reference exceptions and index out of range exceptions uh, on arrays. These particular ones are the various interrupt exceptions from processor. Standard one is divide by zero. We output information to the screen or to the serial port automatically for every exception that occurs so that students can actually see when an exception occurs because often they're quite hard to, they can be quite hard to trace if you haven't got that information. So that's actually just peripheral stuff. If the entire operating system crashes, you can access this variable to find out what the last exception was that was thrown. Um, but actually throwing an exception is just a case of that. It's just call the throw method with an object that describes an exception. And again, we have our own replacement exception class instead of the one that's built into the .NET framework. Um, so that's throwing an exception. Handling an exception, standard try-catch block. Okay? There's nothing special about it. You don't have to go around manually calling methods to add exception handlers. Um, the, only exception to the, <laughs> the only exception to that rule is when the operating system first starts, if I find the file, at the beginning of the main method, you have to add a null handler. 
but that's the only requirement for exception handling setup. It's very simple. Standard catch block. However, we don't support filters on catch blocks because we replace the exception object. Um, well, replace the exception base class. Uh, MS Build won't accept it if you put your own class in the catch brackets, which is remarkably annoying. Um, well, what we have instead is just saying if the current exception is of, scroll across a bit, whichever type you were looking for. It's really actually not that much harder to write. Um, if anything, it makes a little more sense because it, it, there's a little less black, black magic in how the exception is being handled. Um, so no, we don't have filters, unfortunately. Uh, what about standard runtime checks? Yes, the compiler will insert null reference checks. It will insert index out of range exception checks, stuff like that. So to think, right, what are some of our system capabilities? Let's just take a quick look. Hopefully, the last compiler did will actually work. So you can run this in VMware, in VirtualBox, on real hardware, or even on a MIPS Creator CI20 um, embedded device. So I'm just running this in VMware now. Nice splash screen that starts up. There's already been some initialization. Does a ton of stuff and then just sits there. Um, and I can type into it. There you go. So that's our shell, basically. It doesn't do a great deal at the moment. We've just been going through a huge code base transformation to fit multitasking right in at the bottom of the operating system stack, uh, which means that some of these functions described here don't quite work yet because they were written in a single tasking environment. So there's about a month, month or two more work to retransform it. Um, but yeah, we do have quite a bit of capability. Um, so that, that, this, this is what it looks like. It's nothing overly fancy. And it, it's, our functionality is roughly equivalent to DOS 5.0, going a long way back, um, or five, DOS 5.1-ish. Uh, our console, we can actually start multiple shells and either all tab between them or relay out the window. Um, so you've actually got multiple things on, on screen. One fun little feature is, is this thing up in the corner that you see flickering away. It is actually alternating between two and one incredibly quickly. It's the idle thread. Windows has an idle thread that sits in the background. It never shows it to you because it takes up 98% of CPU time a lot of the time, except when Chrome is consuming everything. Um, so it, it scares, they, they did originally show it in the task manager, by the way, but it scared users when users saw something taking up most of the CPU time. Um, so our idle thread just, it never sleeps, it just goes around in the background, flicking that one character on the screen. Whoops. Well, there you go. I type the Windows key in the operating system and it doesn't understand that. Wonderful. We have developers uh, working on various different systems. Um, so not our keyboard support. Supports all the basic characters, uh, all, all the standard keys uh, and various function keys, but it's sort of um, looking up scan codes can be a bit tricky uh, for different keyboards. So a little bit of multitasking. How do we do multitasking in a C-sharp operating system? Cool. So we're going to look at briefly the initialization code required for multitasking, and then I'll show you how we start a process and thread, how we sleep one, and hopefully, well, then I put hopefully in there, because you've just seen it running. You've just seen it running different tasks simultaneously. Um, it only uses a single core at the moment, which is why it's multitasking, not multiprocessing. Multiprocessing is when you're actually capable of using multiple cores or multiple processes in the system. Uh, Multitasking is when you're just capable of switching between different tasks. Okay, so. The magic happens in the main method to start with. We first initialize a load of COM ports. Um, the first one is used for text output. Basically, you can hook into the file and see all the logs. The second one is used for communication with the debugger. 
and the third one is used for notifications to the debugger. You may have noticed when I started it up a minute ago, I didn't have a debugger attached. You don't have to have a debugger attached for the operating system to work. Uh, if you attach our debugger to it, then um, it will take control automatically. So after initializing the processor, we can then start to look at initializing a process. So I've gone straight in here to create a process, and this is trying to create the main process for the entire kernel. Okay. So create process just takes a delegate to a function, in this case the kernel task main function. It takes a string, which is the name of the process you're trying to create, and it takes a boolean indicating whether it's user mode or not. So we can create user mode processes if we want to. Um, we haven't really done that yet because we're still working at the drivers and kernel level. Um, the processor man process manager needs to be able to know which process is the kernel process. You don't have to do that for other processes. Uh, there's then initialization for this particular process of sorting out the stack, essentially. Um, the context it's currently executing in is one that's pre-created by the initialization process from the bootloader. Okay, uh, Immediately after the bootloader, it does a load of initialization and the stack was pre-allocated as part of the assembly code. The process created by create process in the process manager goes away and al actually allocates more memory from elsewhere in the virtual memory. Um, but because we don't want to lose all of the context, we want to be able to keep the exception handling uh, stack that's been set up. We switch this process that we've just created, we s replace the empty stack that was created for it with the stack we're currently executing on. Um, it replaces it with the top of the stack, so it, it's not like it's suddenly switching and overwriting itself. Ignoring those. And then it's just a case of registering the process with the process manager. This puts it on the scheduling list. We have a single scheduling list, um, and each process has a flag saying how much time, well, sorry, an integer saying how much time it's got left to run and whether it's sleeping. Um, there are more intelligent ways of doing scheduling, we're aware. We're aware our scheduler is not fast. Um, but again, it's the give people a simple implement implementation that they can understand the intention of the code and then allow them to implement better solutions on top of that. Our articles go into more detail about better ways of doing each aspect. Um, okay. And then for different processes, well, each, each process individually can determine which interrupt service routines or interrupt requests or system calls it wants to handle. So that's quite simple to do. And then lastly, we go and initialize the timer. The timer on x86 is the uh, programmable interval timer. It's an interesting little device with a long history. Um, it originally had three timer devices on it. That's an entertaining piece of knowledge. Uh, one of which powers the PC speaker, which produces the wonderful beep tone. Um, the, sec the first timer on it is generally used for scheduling and for wait tasks. And the third timer has, for a very long time, not been included in the hardware. You could try to configure it, but it won't do anything. Um, essentially, Intel decided that it was redundant. So that's a bit of fun. Unfortunately, the PC speaker timer is also being removed. This laptop, for example, doesn't have it. Um, this, it creates an interesting effect um, from an operating system point of view, because when you run it in a virtual machine, a virtual machine can only use what hardware is actually available. So we have a startup tune further down here, which has been commented out because of the number of users that complained that they couldn't hear it on their computer running it in a virtual machine, to which we kept having to reply, does your computer actually have a PC speaker? Um, the answer is a lot these days don't. <laughs> so yeah. So after we've initialized the timer and things, we do our splash screen. And by the time we get down here, we can initialize the scheduler. And then this just does a busy wait until the scheduler takes over. So while it's in this while loop, it's kind of in this intermediate floating state of 
being in where it was when it started up and waiting for the scheduler to go, right, I'm interrupting now and I'm going to switch to the first process, which is the kernel process. So, kernel process has to do a large amount of setup. Um, but creating a thread, that's probably not the best example actually, sorry. Um, this is what's required for creating a thread at our level. When you're running inside of a process, you have to do a system call. We have a system calls class and then just call the start thread method. Start thread goes down and actually work, performs the mechanics of doing a system call. So system call number. This is the conversion from a delegate to a pointer. And then it casts that pointer straight to an integer. Okay, our system is entirely 32-bit. You could do 64-bit system with this, um, but our compiler doesn't support it right now. Um, the entire operating system has casts like this in it in different places. Um, we're not too worried about that because actually upgrading from 32 to 64 bit is quite easy uh, conceptually. Um, so this, this method is plugged by this file. And in fact, I forgot to explain why this doesn't have a file extension. The reason it doesn't have a file extension is because the compiler automatically appends a file extension to it. It will append .x86.asm or .mips.asm MIPS 32, I think, actually, um, depending on what architecture you're targeting at compile time. So you can use the same file name in the same folder and then just have different versions of the file depending on different target architectures. It's quite nice, it's quite simple to do. And in Visual Studio, all of our assembly code resides in these ASM folders, for example, here. And if we look at the file properties, you can see it, does, it simply does a content and copy if newer, so it copies it to the output directory. This only has x86 versions. If I show you our testing kernel, um, we have MIPS and x86 versions. Yep. So, to give you an idea, this oh yeah, our compiler we can also disable debug and garbage collector statements for an entire function if we want to. Um, this is because interrupt handlers, for example, you can't do things like memory allocation and deallocation uh, during an inter a critical interrupt. So we deliberately disable things like the garbage collector calls during those. Um, has some interesting side effects. We can also disable debug for various methods. Um, this is because some methods you simply don't want to break inside of them because they get called so frequently. Uh, and to include debug in them would just slow the whole thing down beyond belief. Um, so if I go to this plug file, so it's in ASM, object utilities, get handle, and you can see it's, it's um, pretty straightforward. That's the method declaration stuff. This says it's 32 bit. This says it goes in the code section of the output file. Uh, this allows the label to be accessed outside of this assembly file. Uh, it's a bit like public, in a sense. Uh, this is the actual declaration of the method. We have a standard format for method names in our assembly code. Everything starts with method underscore. Static fields start with static field underscore, for example. Then you get, whoops, sorry. Then you get the return type, followed by ret end, which means return end. Um, kernel.utilities.objectutilities declaration ends so the class it was declared in. Get handle is the name, name end, followed by parameters. Standard format. We have a small utility tool for generating um, this one. Small utility tool for generating those method label names if you can't be bothered to work it out in your head. It gets a little bit tricky when you start using pointer types because things like the star 
have to be replaced by underscores. Uh, brackets in function names get replaced by underscores, stuff like that. So you start ending up with lots of underscores in some places. So the ASM method label builder makes it a little bit easier to work with. So this is that stub method that's just converting any object, in fact, but in this case, uh, a delegate, uh, straight into a pointer. And all it's actually doing is copying the value from one place to another. It's not doing anything fancy. It's just returning the value you pass to it. Uh, this is because you can't cast directly from an object to a pointer in C Sharp. Even with the unsafe stuff enabled, you can't cast directly from an object to a pointer. Um, so this is just kind of a, a workaround, if you like. Um, it adds a little bit of a performance hit for every time you have to call it, because you're calling what's essentially uh, a method doing nothing. Um, but it's not too much of an issue. You can see here we do actually have support for all the standard ref out keywords in C-sharp. You've got all the usual power that's available to you. And that's because it's all handled at the IL level. If you support all the IL ops, you don't have to do anything fancy in the code generation. Um, we have support for approximately 215 out of 230 IL ops. The only ones we don't support, I think, are things like box and unbox. Um, simply because a low-level box and unbox don't really make any sense. Um, you'd use a pointer to something instead of boxing it. Um, we've never had need of box and unbox. So the system call itself, this is again a plugged method with some assembly code. There's not too much assembly code lying around the place. I'm, sure I'm deliberately showing you ones that call into assembly code. Uh, don't get the idea that everything has to be plugged everywhere. Um, I'm, I'm just deliberately highlighting these. Um, so yeah, that does a system call, which will crop up in the kernel task. In fact, no, it won't. It will crop up elsewhere. But eventually, um, I, I'm not going to try showing you the assembly code for the interrupt handler right now, but suffice to say the interrupt handler calls straight into um, the sys system call handler here. Okay, so There's a little bit of stub assembly code that handles the interrupt and then just calls straight into here. Um, and this does the processing for the system call and then returns. You can't write uh, an interrupt handler directly in C sharp. The reason being the same reason as you can't write it in C you have to use an interrupt return operation, IRET, instead of a standard return operation. Okay, so uh, we have, I'm gonna go through a bit faster now. Um, we have interest process communication, we have two forms, message passing and pipes. So we can, we can show you all of that. Um, these are relatively recent things. This is part of our multi multitasking transformation of the code base. What about security? We'll get there eventually. We haven't got security right now. The whole, the whole thing is just like a wet paper towel. You can poke holes in it everywhere if you wanted to. Um, there's two reasons for this. One is because security takes up a lot of time to actually implement and to try and do it well, you'd need an expert. I'm not a security expert. Um, no, no one on the team at the moment is a security expert. Second reason is also security adds a lot of complexity to the code base. Fling OS, the aim is to keep it simple. So we prefer to write in our articles, look, this, this is a security flaw, you need to fix it, here's a suggestion as to how to fix it, but then keep the code simple so that people can go to it and actually read the code and understand the intention of the code, rather than getting caught up in a, I thought it was trying to do this, but it's going off and doing all these bits, what are they for? And all those bits being the security aspect. So we have pipes, and our pipes are unidirectional buffered. You can do block blocking and non-blocking operation on our pipes uh, on the same pipe. Uh, I was going to go into a bit of detail about how it was used. But. So other capabilities, we have PS2 keyboard and mouse support. We support ATA, specifically PATA. Uh, we haven't got onto SATA yet, but we will get there. Uh, that's one of the things we're hoping to do next summer. We have PCI enumeration. We have USB 2.0 support for mass storage devices. Uh, we're very close to having um, keyboard and mouse, so uh, various other diff USB is very, very big and complex, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, but suffice to say, keyboards and mice are not like mass storage devices, but 
we're really close to adding support for those. And there's various other bits of drivers in there as well. Our code base is actually reasonably advanced. In, in just 18 months, we've gone from nothing to having all of this. Uh, Cosmos, for example, uh, that I was speaking about to you earlier, after seven years, they still haven't got full multi multitasking working and their ATA slash FAT, we do have file system on top of this, by the way, um, code is buggy as hell. doesn't work very well. And they've been going for seven years. So we think we're doing really well for just 18 months of development with mostly myself and then a few other people over the, over the summer. Uh, yeah, recent work means that these drivers at the moment are actually unstable and not working very well. Um, but within a couple of months, we'll have them back to a fully working state again. So C Sharp for an operating system. We do have a debugger. We have a custom debugger built for this. It doesn't integrate with Visual Studio. Uh, it's a command line thing, so you could actually directly connect to the COM port on the operating system and type commands into it and see the response and step through stuff. Or you can use our GUI debugger, which runs on the host. The GUI debugger is also written in C Sharp. Uh, this means that you can actually see everything in C Sharp. You can see how a debugger works in detail. Um, and the debugger does actually fully understand threads, processes, arguments and locals, types of arguments and locals. It understands object types so you can load fields from objects. It's quite an advanced feature, something that a lot of C-based debuggers can't do. You have to manually work out the address and the offsets from it. I will do it all automatically. And it can even automatically load strings and show you the values of them. So we have quite an advanced debugger. Breakpoints, you can put them in those specific knops that I showed you earlier. It replaces the knop with an int3, interrupt3 operation. Um, we can also single step through individual lines of assembly. Um, we are working on setting breakpoints at any arbitrary address. Uh, but that's a little bit more complicated to do because you have to work out where the operation starts, take the operation code, replace it with the interrupt, store the operation code somewhere else. When you get to the operation, you then have to substitute it back in, step over the instruction, and then replace it back with the breakpoint again. It's a lot more complicated than just putting it in three and there and leaving it. Um, the reason it's easier with replacing a NOP with an in three is one, NOP is a constant instruction. We don't have to remember it. And secondly, NOP and INT3 have exactly the same instruction size encoding, one byte. Um, our GUI does need a little bit of work. <laughs> if you fancy doing some open source development, um, we'd love someone to come along and actually do a bit more UX design uh, on it. Uh, but it's perfectly usable. Um, it's perfectly decent. I was going to go over there and give you an example. We, we can, yeah. Other uh, alternatives, if you come across GDB, uh, that's an alternative GNU debugger, um, but it doesn't really support C Sharp, which is why we went and wrote our own. We'd love to be able to integra integrate with Visual Studio, but as I was saying, Cosmos have been working. I worked on Cosmos for six months working on their debugger integration. Um, they got very hung up on it. We didn't want to get hung up trying to implement integration with it. We also didn't want to get tied into Visual Studio too much. All of our code currently, you can actually compile it outside of the Visual Studio environment. Um, so that's why we don't have integration there. We have Fling Oops. <laughs> Oops, I made a mistake in the compiler. Um, it's a behavioral testing, so you run the kernel and it will tell you which bits of the compiler you broke, basically. Uh, that got implemented over the summer. Imagination Technologies uh, sponsored an intern, Roland Barani, a uh, third year student well, now 30th student here at the university to work over the summer with me um, to add both MIPS support to the compiler and to do this testing kernel. So we support their Creator CI20 uh, development platform as our embedded kind of device that we can run Fling OS on. Uh, we can't run the full operating system on it yet. We're working on implementing the full operating system for it. But obviously, it's an embedded device, so the set of capabilities is slightly different. Um, So our plan is to grow our code base, add more support for other architectures. We'd love to be able to create a kit for A-level and first year university students so they can actually get hands on with this and have something tangible to work with. Um, we want to expand our, we've currently got over 30 articles, we want to expand that to over 80 next summer and we want to create a further 15 tutorial videos on top of the 10 we have.
Um, we produced 30 plus the 10 tutorial videos in just one summer. This is in the summer just gone. So we know this is achievable. Uh, and yeah, we, we, we're doing this using summer interns, myself included. I work for free this summer for all three months. Um, as a student, I can't really afford to do that again next summer, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, and also to achieve this much stuff, we need to have more people on board. We have myself and one person this year. I'd like to be able to have five people, myself included, next year uh, to grow this a lot more. So for that reason, I'm going to do a little bit of a pitch. Um, we are looking for sponsorship and support for next summer. So if you or your company think you can support us, uh, we'd love to hear from you. We really would. Uh, we need sponsorship for interns to pay, basically be able to pay them and give them the small amount of equipment they need, things like Creator CI20s. I've got one here tonight, by the way, if you want to have a look. Um, but also, if, if, you, if you can't, it doesn't have to be monetary, you can support us. Uh, we like people guest writing for our blog. Um, you're welcome to come and present here at the university. Do get in contact with me. I am Social Secretary for the Bristol Electronic and Electrical Engineering Society, BEES for short. Head to bees.co.uk, bees with three E's, please, not two. Um, we, we can arrange for you to come and give technical talks here at the university to CS and E students. Um, and also just tweeting or sharing if you like our project. We'd really appreciate that and any feedback you have. So that's at FlingOS, facebook.com slash Fling Operating System or head to www.flingos.co.uk. Thank you. I've been in with nothing. Any questions? Have you had any interest from the universities? Um, one or two universities have been in touch. I'm not going to name them tonight, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, we're communicating with people. Uh, I, I work quite closely with Professor David May here at the university. Um, for those of you who don't know, he did kind of the transputer back in the 80s um, and various other things as well. The project is supported by both the heads of the CS and the EE departments and the Dean of the Engineering Faculty. Um, so it's, it's well supported and I'm communicating with Bristol uh, while I'm here about doing more in their course and incorporating Fling OS. I ran some extracurricular lectures and workshops this term that were well attended by students uh, that's provided us with a lot of valuable feedback as kind of a trial run. Um, so this, this is gaining support. And the, the online community is huge We're relative to for such a young project. We, we get 3,000 uh, views for the articles per month, 1,000 views of the videos per month. Um, the blog has averaged 4,500 views since it launched six months ago. Um, so yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of encouragement and feedback about this. That was my phone, sorry. <laughs> What's the, um, the roadmap going forward? I mean, how, how far do you want to take this? Because like you said a few times, there are places where you can make optimizations, but that's not really the point. So how, how much do you think you're going to flesh it out before it's achieved? Yeah. Yeah, good question. So, um, as with any projects, there's a risk of just endlessly spoiling the project out. What we'd like to be able to say is we have drivers for all the key areas that you'd want to do. So, network, some basic graphics drivers, USB, um, we've, well, I mean, we've roughly got USB, serial. We'd like to slightly expand our hard disk support. We support CD drives and hard, PASA hard disk, but we'd like to add SATA. Um, and also expanding our support a little bit for embedded devices. Um, so adding possibly ARM and Raspberry Pi to the list um, just to make it comprehensive. And then writing all the articles about those aspects as well. That, that's roughly the end, end goal. Um, if you, there, there's some interesting history behind the name. <laughs> uh, it's called Fling OS because the idea, uh, I like to have an unrealistic goal on my project so that I never run out of work in a sense. Uh, the unrealistic goal was to have um, applications running on it that you could literally just swipe and fling it to any other device running off Fling OS, um, and it would seamlessly transfer the application across. It's it's a fanciful idea. It doesn't quite. I mean, there are some things that just about manage it on Windows for some applications. Uh, for example, um, I mean, it, it would be technically possible to implement, but that's not the aim of the project in a sense. 
but that's where the name came from. Have you got one? Are you going to implement a network stack? We haven't got one at the moment. We will implement one. Um, we we've had to change a little bit of our focus over the summer uh, with what we were working on to increase the number of articles and documentation. Basically, um, we'll get around to doing a network stack next year, hopefully. But obviously, that kind of depends on us being able to employ enough people uh, to actually do the project. Um, there is a slight risk at the moment that if we don't get funding, I simply won't be able to work on it because I'll need to go and get a different job to support myself. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with student loans. That's the thing. So, yeah. What was the most difficult part of the project so far? Ooh, tough question. Um, The scheduling aspect, basically, the multi-processing aspect and transitioning from one to the other, it comes with a lot of problems, um, basically, especially as when you first implement a scheduler and stuff like that, if it's not stable, you can't actually have a debugging thread. So you can't have a debugger that understands the multi-threaded environment you're working in. And you also can't have a debugger that's single tasking because it slows the system down so far that you simply never get around to running the code that would actually cause a problem. So yeah, that was probably the toughest part. How did you get interested in something like this at the age of 17? Um, yeah, probably more at the age of 15, I guess, would be a, a better place to start. Um, I built an 8-bit computer in Minecraft from scratch, from not Gates, under my own design. And when I say an 8-bit computer in Minecraft, I don't just mean the ALU that a lot of people do, I mean 256 bytes of programmable memory, two memory banks of 16 bytes each, memory management uh, section in it, uh, f full ALU, so all the operations, keyboard input, display output, you name it. It was, ge it was a general purpose computer in Minecraft. So that was where my interest in low level started. Uh, with my work at Imagination in graphics and drivers and stuff like that, uh, that encouraged it. I also did a few small embedded devices for my school for different bits to do with uh, technical lighting in theatres. So. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Um, it will get posted online.